demonstrated again at the weekend, their struggle will not end. And Beijing must come to realize it cannot successfully fight the future because time is on the side of the pro-democracy movement, deeply committed and courageous men and women who will not be silent. And while we in the free world have cherished freedoms and liberties, we, while that, those freedoms continue, will provide platforms and opportunities through the all-party parliamentary group to hear the voices that the CCP tries to silence. Two years ago, I had the privilege of chairing a meeting at Westminster for Joshua Wong and Nathan Law, who'd been elected as the youngest member of the Hong Kong Legislative Council. I pointed out that in my day, a long time ago, I too had been the youngest member of a legislature, the United Kingdom House of Commons. And perhaps we babies of the house have a special duty to look out for one another. Now at great risk and sacrifice, Nathan has now left Hong Kong, carrying just his backpack sent by his colleagues and friends to ensure that their voice does indeed continue to be heard. Nathan Law is one of Hong Kong's most prominent young pro-democracy activists. He was one of the leaders of the Umbrella Movement in 2014, the founder and chairman of the now disbanded political party, Demos Isto. In 2016, he was elected the youngest ever member of the Legislative Council, just aged 23. A year later, he was disqualified from the Legislative Council after the Hong Kong government challenged in the courts the validity of his oath taking. And in August 2017, he was sentenced to eight months in prison alongside Joshua Wong and Alex Chow, becoming among the first political prisoners in Hong Kong. In 2018, he, along with Joshua and Alex and the Umbrella Movement, they were nominated by members of the US Congress for the Nobel Peace Prize. On the 2nd of July, he announced that he had left Hong Kong after the imposition of the new national security law. This webinar will investigate how the United Kingdom government can support Nathan Law and his friends and colleagues and effectively oppose the constraints that have resulted in his escape of Hong Kong, as well as many others. So just as we start and reiterating what Chris has said to you already, let me give you some ground rules. Laura Croyston will be your key point of contact for the webinar should you have any issues or any questions. I think you've got Laura's email address, but her telephone number is 07505038602. All participants and guests are encouraged to use your video function. All guests will be muted as they enter the conference call. The webinar will be recorded by the all-party parliamentary group uh, and used uh, subsequently. Participants who want to ask questions should do so via the chat function rather than verbally, and the Secretariat will then collate them for the Q&A discussion, which I'll moderate. If my broadband connection from Lancashire fails me, one of the Secretariat will continue the meeting. It's now my great pleasure to invite Nathan to outline his experiences and the implications that his story has on freedoms and democracy, how those now targeted by the new national security law could be helped by the rest of us. Ladies and gentlemen, Nathan Law. Thanks so much, David. Um, it's my great pleasure to be able to um, uh, meet, uh, meet you uh, several years ago, and uh, for now, you've been uh, a very vocal voice for the Hong, for Hong Kong and Hong Kong democratic movement, so I really appreciate that. And thank you for the other members who have uh, joined this meeting, and I think this is very important because uh, we are encountering a historical moment for Hong Kong which we actually witnessed um, the utter collapse of one country, two system under the national security law. And uh, the story of Hong Kong, uh, the democratic movement of Hong Kong started 30 years ago when the negotiation of Hong Kong handover started. A uh, British government had a negotiation with Chinese government about how Hong Kong should be governed after 1997, which Hong Kong was handed back to China by the British government. And by then, uh, well, both parties ex established some grant. And the two most fundamental pillars of one country, two system is first, Hong Kong people ruling Hong Kong, which means that we will eventually have democracy. And the other is high degree of autonomy, which we can preserve our way of life and we can have our uh, so-called capitalist life under the socialist ruling. So uh, basically it is a protocol that keeps Hong Kong um, unchanged after 1997, even though the sovereignty had changed. 
So under the one country, two system, Hong Kong people shall enjoy freedom, uh, autonomy, and eventually democracy. So after 23 years of implementation, we've seen a lot of protests and a lot of challenges towards one country, two system. But uh, mostly those challenges um, are for the democracy and for freedom. But this one, the particular national security law, it basically is the last nail of the coffin of one country, two system, because it has completely demolished the autonomy of Hong Kong. Beijing could now have a secret agency in Hong Kong, which uh, they send uh, the, those high officials uh, in the Guangdong and Southern China area to override the authority of uh, Hong Kong government. So for now, the national security law's direct impact is, uh, well, we are now losing, we are now losing one country, two system, and it comes to an end. So for me, I, I've been very active for the past six years in Hong Kong's democratic movement. In 2014, I was a student leader. We were just fighting for universal suffrage and, uh, of course, it failed. Uh, the umbrella movement did not achieve uh, concrete change in terms of political reform in Hong Kong, but it actually triggered a lot of political awakening for the younger generation. And also that was the first time Hong Kong had the civil disobedience movement, which caught the attention of the world. In 2016, I was elected as the youngest member in the LegCo as um, David just uh, illustrated. And um, in 2017, um, I was degraded from a member of parliament to a prisoner in just a month. So it was quite a, a sh well, quite a encountering for me. And it also signaled the deterioration of Hong Kong's politics. Because in before, uh, we thought that, oh, uh, democratic can could also chair the government once the democracy is realized. So that for the, part, for the first decade of the one country, two system, the democratic camp still could have a healthy dialogue with the government. And the government, the government did not dare to um, really push really hardline policies to the democratic camp because the, the Democrats uh, in the LegCo could, could one day be the leader of the city. That's what they thought. That's what they thought that Hong Kong could have democracy in some times in the future. But recently, um, as Beijing has determined not to give Hong Kong democracy, um, so we, we could see that political situation in Hong Kong deteriorated really rapidly. In 2014, we've got the umbrella movement. In 2016, we've got very young and talented and um, uh, a sector heads from the movement to go into the council. In 2017, some of them are being disqualified and some of them are being barred from running for election. And for me, I, I was jailed for my participation in the uh, a peaceful demonstration in 2014, which also triggered a lot of international criticism. So um, I was a lively example of how Hong Kong's politics deteriorated. And up until now, I, I once again became uh, the spotlight of the media because I decided to leave Hong Kong. And this is a painful decision because it means that I have to leave behind all my connections, my family, my friends, and I could be named as traders, sessions, and whatsoever that the Communist Party would fabricate or cook up for me. But my position is very simple. Under the national security law, the international advocates work that we used to do would no longer be able to do on the ground in Hong Kong, which means that if I were in Hong Kong and conduct this uh, webinar with all of the members and uh, the media here, I could be indicted by the national security law because I was possibly spreading hatred towards central government or encouraging sanctions to the central government whatsoever, they could always find a way to um, really prosecute people under such a thickly written national security law. So for me, I need to preserve a voice on the international level. And a, a public figure with international profile is suitable to fill this role. So for me, I had to leave in order to preserve a voice to tell the truth on the international level. And that was my decision. So I, once again, had a massive change in my state of mind, state of status. I, were running, I was running for the Legislative Council election for September before I left. I was popular. I was, uh, well, I had a really high margin of winning it. If Beijing does not 
not qualify, does not bar me from running, I will be sitting in the chamber in September. But I decided to do it because I think um, this is more than my personal interest. It's more than my personal consideration. Uh, I have a greater co a greater cause to preserve and a greater cause to pursue. And I have made my choice that I need to leave Hong Kong in order to preserve a very a precious voice on the international level. So here I am in London and having this dialogue with uh, David and all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Nathan, for setting us on such a good course for the discussion that will now follow. Um, some of my parliamentary colleagues who may be called away to other business, I know I will certainly bring them in very quickly into the discussion. If I may, I'd like to just start off by asking you about a decision that's been made uh, by the British government and that will be uh, enacted in both houses. Uh, the debate in the House of Lords will be the week after next on the so-called Mag Magnitsky sanctions some of which will be targeted at Communist Party officials in China who have been targeting, for instance, the Uyghurs in Xinjiang, but some might also be imposed on people in Hong Kong who have been responsible for some of the uh, brutality, but also the destruction of two systems, one country. How do, you, how do you think Beijing will react, Nathan, as a consequence of this? I see that yesterday it was reported that a number of United States senators and Congress and, uh, and Ambassador Brownback, who's been promoting uh, freedom of religion or belief in, in, in China, um, I, but they have all now been put on the, another list, a list that's been created by the CCP. And no doubt that even at, as we're speaking, looking at people in the United Kingdom to add to that, to that number. How do you think Beijing will respond, though, in not just in terms of gestures and, and, and lists, but... Do, do, will they take any notice, do you think, of things like these Magnitsky sanctions that are being imposed by the British Parliament? Well, of course, I think Beijing will react angrily um, because, uh, well, it's their foreign policy under Xi Jinping. Um, it is so different from the ones uh, by Deng Xiaoping, which uh, really stressed on uh, laying low and being humble in the international stage and try not to um, ignite any controversy or any conflicts. But now uh, the foreign policy under Xi Jinping has been really aggressive and trying to um, well, compete uh, the world leaders and, and becoming more well, dominant in the region. So it definitely has backfired. So I think, um, yes, indeed, uh, that kind of like uh, the act from uh, the implementation, implementation of Magnitsky Act will definitely um, trigger uh, China's response. But for me, I, I don't think that is something that would stop us, what stops the Western democracy from doing so, because that is the, uh, well, the, the core of the problem is Beijing has been circumventing all the international monitoring and re, uh, reviews to reveal its commitment in democracy and human rights. And if we continue to endorse that kind of mentality, and continue to have trade with them without any human rights clauses in, inside it, then we're actually encouraging their authoritarian expansion and leaving those in Xinjiang concentration or human rights lawyer in Hong Kong, in China, or protesting in Hong Kong behind. I don't think that is the right gesture uh, from the Western democracy, especially a leading country, uh, UK, leading country like UK. So I think it is important that for us, we have to make the Ministry Act is effective, targeting um, not only like officials in Xinjiang, but also in Hong Kong, Carrie Lam could be a target. And the reason why is we have no checks and balances in our system anymore. There is nothing that could hold the Chinese government and Hong Kong government accountable in our system. We've seen so many cases of police brutality, but none of them are in any forms of investigation. We've seen Carrie Lam's popular rating has been really extremely bad. It's like minus 40, 30, but she could still be on her seat and conduct all the political mission from Xi Jinping. And that is not fair to Hong Kong people and that's not the right way to conduct policy and politics. So I think, yes, indeed, um, uh, the UK has a certain responsibility or uh, if they could come into it, then definitely that would be a good news for the Western world. 
for Carrie Lamb to be listed under the new Magnitsky regime. I'm going to turn now to my colleague, Fiona Bruce, Member of Parliament, who's the MP for Congleton, but is also the chair of the Conservative Party's Human Rights Commission. And after that, I'll go to Lord Chinquin. And on my list, following that, is the founder of Hong Kong Watch, Benedict Rogers. And after that, from IPAC, Luke de Pulford. So kicking off, uh, over to you, Fiona Bruce, please. Thank you very much. And Nathan, thank you for talking with us today. Good to see you. Um, you've bravely left uh, Hong Kong to, to be a voice internationally. It's early days yet, but how do you see that working out? Uh, and, and secondly, of course, many of your activist colleagues remain in Hong Kong. How do you see their future now under these new laws? Well, um, before I left Hong Kong, I had a um, long dialogue with Joshua and we all know that our position and what we will be doing so I, I believe that we are responsible to fight in different fronts and we have different duties in such a massive movement and we will bear it with uh, all we can and we will default in it. And we hope that all our decisions and the actions that we are doing could uh, reciprocate back to Hong Kong people and back to the movement. So I worry about them, but um, we all know that we are doing the right thing and we have our own duty to fulfill. And for me, I think, uh, well, I, I've left Hong Kong um, for a while, it is around two weeks. Uh, I, I indeed feel like my move is very symbolic, is a, a, a strong signal to the international community that there's something wrong in Hong Kong. Because if you check, like, when the international media recognized my profile, I was the youngest member of parliament, highly popular, was constantly elected as like top 10 legislator in Hong Kong. Uh, I had a, well, possibly a really good future as a politician in a democratic world, if I continue to do so. But why such a profile figure would leave Hong Kong and that brings the questions and curiosity. So for me, um, I think the, 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 the interest now, um, especially in the UK and the European Union started to rise really rapidly and I have received uh, several very prominent and invitations from very prominent um, <clears throat> current affairs programs and um, really good receptions. And um, uh, so I think, I hope my presence could really push forward um, the Western world to form a more united and cohesive and assertive front towards China. Uh, otherwise, if there are only several of us being really strong to them, asking them to in alliance with human rights clauses, then they could just find another country if it's like economically strong and do trade with them and circumvent all the um, a, a circumvent all the um, mechanism that hold them accountable. So I think we need a united front, and um, that's why I'm here to uh, really talk the truth of Hong Kong people. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you I so now much. turn to. Kevin Chinquin, Lord Chinquin, who is the Vice Chairman of the All-Party Parliamentary Group. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, David. And Nathan, thank you for making the time to talk to us and for your sacrifice in making the difficult decision to put the interests of the movement uh, ahead of perhaps your desire to remain in Hong Kong with your friends, your comrades and your family. Um, I think I can say that you have our support, uh, certainly. Um, I will never forget watching Tiananmen Square Massacre live on TV. And I was wondering what more you would like to see the UK government do in addition to what it has announced uh, for those who have uh, passports and BNO status? Well, of course, um, I think Hong Kong people generally welcome that decision and very grateful that um, UK government could have a very swift uh, response towards the implementation of national security law. And I was actually very surprised when I learned that a majority of UK citizens support that decision thinking that UK government has an obligation to do it. Um, I read it from a poor data. 
And I, I really do think that um, what, ha what happened for in Hong Kong for the past year really reshaped how the ordinary people look at China and look at UK to become more uh, responsible or bearing more responsibility in terms of leading democracy and liberal values. So I do really appreciate that. And uh, given that for now, uh, the, the BNO, well, uh, there could possibly be 3 million um, people uh, benefit from, from the policy. I've always been thinking about uh, whether there are well, ways of helping those underage and uh, without BNO, especially those uh, protesters who have been fighting frontline. Um, so I think this is the direction that we could possibly have to, because I think it, it is not, uh, well, the, the, uh, what, what is important is not that how many people could come. I, I don't think that would be a lot. I don't think that there will be like millions of people coming to the UK. No, that, that's not going to happen. But we have to send a signal that we, we are with them. And if the Hong Kong government knows that they actually are allowed to leave, they have a safe plan for them, they will reconsider when they um, have a very hard-lined approach to them because they have got some more options to think about. So for me, um, yes, indeed, uh, we, wel we really welcome and appreciate um, the measures. And we could still explore and look into more development on that in order to send a stronger signal. Thank you. Thanks Thank so you, Nathan. If there's time, I think probably we might like to explore that issue further, uh, not least because some people who are BNO holders might also be people that we wouldn't want to welcome in the United Kingdom if they've been involved in, for instance, acts of brutality against demonstrators. Uh, also, the need for an international lifeboat as well, that other countries need to step up to the plate to provide that insurance policy that you just talked about. So maybe we can, if there's time, return to that a little later in our discussion. But it's now my pleasure to give the floor to Benedict Rogers, who is the founder of Hong Kong Watch, and then if Luke de Pulford would stand by. Thank you very much. Um, Nathan, can I um, add in this forum, although obviously I've done it privately already, my, my welcome to you, to this country. I wish the circumstances were not that you had to be here, but um, since you are, you, you're, you have many friends here and so welcome. And of course, we first met uh, four years ago when you were a newly elected legislator. And we were last together two years ago when uh, we shared the experience of uh, the Chinese state television reporter uh, assaulting us verbally yeah. and somebody else physically. So that leads into my, my question. Um, one of the most significant things about the national security law uh, is the extraterritorial uh, clause in uh, Article 38, which says that basically anyone in anywhere in the world, even if they're not a Hong Konger, can violate the law outside Hong Kong. You, you've recently uh, published an open letter on the issue of extradition. Um, could you say a bit more about what you're looking to Britain and other countries to do on the issue of extradition? There, there are many things governments should do, but this ought to be a relatively simple one uh, to, uh, to address. Um, and perhaps you could say something about your concerns about security of Hong Kongers in the UK and elsewhere, given this, uh, given Article 38 of the security law. Yes, well, um, thanks, uh, Ben. Uh, there, were, there were two great questions. Um, first, first, I would like to address uh, on my open letter. Because um, when uh, after the implementation of national security law, there are plenty of countries, uh, including the UK, Germany, they um, had a, a, well a speech on the UN and openly uh, opposed uh, the, the national security law. And there are several countries in, in that list uh, which are having a extradition treaty with Hong Kong. So my my point is, when Hong Kong there is no rule of law and uh, people bringing that will possibly uh, submit it to uh, the the indictment of national security law, then we should review that uh, relationship. And actually, um, Canada, uh, well, uh, the US, um, Australia, they have all say, said that um, they will suspend it or cancel it. So I think uh, the UK, I know, is uh, still considering it, and I hope that um, this could happen also uh, with the UK government. And for the next uh, questions, um, it's about, um, well, uh, the, 
the safety and um, the or, or, or the issue of that. I think like so now uh, I, I had a period of um, well hiding my uh, whereabouts because I, I need time to assess the risk and uncertainties. And um, because I had actually received a lot of uh, threatening messages last year uh, when I arrived uh, Yale and start my um, uh, further studies there, uh, there were a lot of threatening messages, and I had to, I had to, I had to seek help from the local authority in order to have personal protection. So I was assessing whether the same will happen again in London. Um, Luckily, I, I think that um, the similar situation has not happened, and um, I'm I feel relatively safe here. So yeah, that that's the reason why I think I I really review my whereabouts and conduct these meetings. I think these are very valuable experience that I could interact with uh, politicians and um uh, uh, uh well uh, political think tanks or organizations around the world. Thank you, Nathan. I, I was very struck recently. The All Party Parliamentary Group has been holding an investigation and inquiry. We've had over a thousand pieces of evidence submitted from people in Hong Kong about the use of police brutality against humanitarian aid workers, nurses, doctors, first aiders. Some of it is truly shocking, but one young doctor in evidence to us just a couple of weeks ago said, with the passing of a national security law, he said, even talk to you now I could be thrown into prison he said they could come crashing through that door I would be taken away and I would disappear and never be seen again so I don't think it's any exaggeration for anyone to talk about the the fearful consequences of even engaging in what we take for granted in free speech of this kind now, yeah yeah I would, I would like to add, add on to it yeah I'm sorry David I would like to add on to it uh, to your answer because uh, I, I just realized that yeah I, I had an answer it, um, from Ben um, I think the, 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 that that is scary though that well basically the law um, covers foreigners and their actions outside Hong Kong so if you are academic or press that you had conducted like for example reports on Xinjiang concentration camp or like the organ houses thing in in China or even the demolition of underground church in China. This could be the evidence of national security law that could in, indict you. So actually the chilling effect and right terror actually spread it to the local international media. For example, New York Times has already moved some of their crews in Hong Kong to Seoul, and they're planning to have a branch in Taiwan. And also, uh, well, numerous uh, academics uh, are, are thinking about um, well, whether they should continue some of the so-called could be sensitive uh, research that could cross the line of the national security law. And also Facebook and Twitter, uh, their Hong Kong branch are elaborating the risk of being indicted and thinking about, well, possibly leaving Hong Kong. So these are the, the, these discussion and impl implicate uh, really serious consequences on Hong Kong. And um, I think, uh, well, uh, politicians or reporters or or, or foreigners, any kind, um, who have been doing some so-called sensitive research on Hong Kong or, or covering it, should be aware, well aware of the law and be aware when you are trying to get into Hong Kong. I'm sure during the session with colleagues from the media later on, they want to explore further with you some of the implications the breaches of Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and taking away free freedom of media, freedom of expression and thought. Um, but also anyone participating even in a call like this could be indicted under the national security law. We've been given advice about even the activities of this all-party parliamentary group. And that, that really does open up a whole new world, which uh, again, I think people will want to explore uh, at, in some detail. Now, an international alliance of legislators has been created. The person who's mainly been behind that is going to ask the next question from IPAC. That's Luke de Poulford. And after that, I'll call John Mullen from the Daily Telegraph. Luke. Uh, thank you, Lord Alton, and thanks, Nathan, for doing this call. Um, look, I was going to ask a question about uh, what international movements could try to do and whether or not you thought it would 
uh, stood any prospect at all of changing Beijing's mind, but I'm going to ask you about something else, um, and maybe you can address the other point later. Um, I have been, as I know you have been, inundated with messages from Hong Kong people all over the world who are scared. And now that you are in a position of, I think, speaking much more freely on their behalf, um, what is it that you would like to say to them, those people who are feeling very fearful about what they can say, um, people who fear that they may be under the extraterritorial extent of the national security law and might be subject to criminal proceedings? Oh, well, thanks for your question, Luke. Um, I think for now, um, uh, for the international community, we have to um, aware that um, the Hong Kong issue is, is um, receiving such a strong bipartisan support and a cross a spectrum, cross political view. And um, it, it is the case in the US, it is the case in the UK. And I hope that I can expand that consensus to uh, more countries and um, very specifically, um, for example, Germany, this is an important country in European Union and we need them to be on board that we could be more assertive to China and we need to hold them accountable, especially on human rights issue. And for the people, people on the ground, I think um, it's important for us to understand that um, the national security law comes with some consequences, bad consequences for China. You see, UK banning Huawei is among one of them. And um, there has been a lot of uh, policy by, for example, Canada, Australia, some countries that we felt like, oh, they, they had good relationship with China, but they also um, come up with uh, some more, uh, well, assertive policy in place. So I think uh, that national security law actually implement with consequences. And for us, uh, we, we should not see it as um, a massive restriction that would um, kill us all. I, I don't think so. It, it does not apply to um, a, such a massive scale that like tens of thousands of people are indicted. I don't, I don't think that would happen. But they wanted to promote a politics of fear, white terror, that uh, it leads to people conducting unnecessary self-censorship. And I think for me and for the international community, we should not self-censor ourselves uh, before they really hand a sword on your head. Um, we should, well, test what again and again, and some of the foregrounds that we have to defend, we defend. So I think this is important that uh, we have different strategy and as uh, the motto of the movement, be water, that we have to adopt the new norm, but it doesn't mean that we will self-censor um, to, uh, uh, well, to an extreme degree. So I think for Hong Kong people and for the international front, we will continue to do what we can. And, um, and also we will uh, continue our work uh, no matter what, uh, maybe in a more subtle or creative way uh, whatsoever, but that, that movement is still alive and we're still working on our, um, with our own capacity. Thank you, Nathan. We're going to turn now to John Mullin from the Daily Telegraph. And after that, we'll hear from Jonathan Miller from ITM. Thanks very much, uh, Lord Alton. Uh, hello, Nathan. Um, uh, nice to speak to you. Um, I wonder if you could tell us why you've chosen London as your base. Uh, and in particular, um, are you satisfied Britain is showing a robust enough response? And is that one of the reasons why you've come here? Well, I think the world is in a lockdown, so um, uh, I, I've got limited choice. Uh, that this. Um, <laughs> secondly, I think um, UK is definitely a, a good place to continue my advocacy work. We've got a huge diaspora Hong Kongese community here, and UK has always been really focal in uh, Hong Kong's issue, and uh, especially recently. And uh, for me, uh, getting more European countries on board is important because you could already see that it's a established consensus in the US for both IOs. They've been really supportive for Hong Kong's movement, but we need that phenomenon happen in the European Union. So I think that is the, the reason why I, I, I came to Europe. And also for UK, it's definitely they have a moral and legal, uh, well, moral or even legal obligation to um, really uh, pay attention to Hong Kong situation under the Sound of British Joint Declaration. So I, I think um, in London, we, we will get a lot of allies' support to do 
international advocacy work. So, um, yeah, uh, well, uh, for me, uh, it, it's also not only about like my, my future is it is not determined yet uh, that there will be a lot of uncertainty. But for now, I, I would love to really be connected with uh, more and more um, political uh, organization and to really spread the message among the crowd. Thanks again, Nathan. Now we turn to Jonathan Miller from ITN. Hi there, Nathan. Um, thank you again for um, being here for us to speak to us tonight. Um, I'm calling in from Bangkok and um, I've been following what has been happening in Hong Kong very closely over the months. Um, I'm interested to know how, um, if Beijing has effectively ended the protests with this new national security law, and if it now disqualifies pan-democratic candidates before September's uh, elections, um, and, and indeed, if, if you know, foreign and local journalists risk crossing a red line when they report on what is going on, public anger will just grow. And if there's no way for Hong Kongers to vent that anger now, as they had been until now on the streets, where do you think that anger could go? Because I've heard whispers of the word resistance. Yeah, um, if you look at the first day of the implementation, uh, 1st of July, there were more than 100,000 people marching down the street. And we just had a primary election for a democratic camp more than 610 and 10,000 people coming out to vote. So these are extraordinary numbers that we could take reference from because Beijing, Beijing's plan was they wanted to, well, basically kill Hong Kong's protests by implementing national security law. They thought that once it was enacted, people won't protest. And that's the reason why they have to hurry and rush and to publish it on 30th of June even though they didn't really have an English draft of that. In Hong Kong, it's so peculiar that we have a law without English trans trans translation because we take the English version as the authority version, which when, when there's divergency, we take reference from the English one. That is the correct one. But the implementation of national security law on the day, there wasn't even an English version of that. So you could see how hasty and how rushed the whole uh, procedure was. And it shows that Beijing wanted to uh, really squash the protest uh, before 1st of July. It was uh, the handover of Hong Kong. It was the fate of Hong Kong. They wanted Hong Kong to be quiet, especially for Xi Jinping. But the reality is it, it triggered uh, much more uh, anger, even amid pandemic, even amid COVID people still come out, people still protest. So I think for me, uh, resistance movement is still there. Uh, people would fend their anger through like voting, through going down to the streets and um, all sorts of actions. And um, we, we've seen, we've, we've already seen um, some, uh, well, some of the participants uh, adjust their actions uh, creatively in order to circumvent the, the the national security law. For example, uh, we had a tradition of like sticking land on wall, which means that we've got a, a wall full of stickers and people write their demands on it. And um, but for now, uh, there are still these wall of stickers, but there are no demands. But their appearance look exactly the same. Uh, it, it's just well, the, the the owners of the shop or owners of the land on wall, well, um, do it because. Um, the government cannot uh, will prosecute them with blank paper. Well, that that is the reason behind. So I think, uh, yeah, indeed, we are having a lot of um, resistance uh, actions now. And I think people will adopt the new norm and trying to continue to test the government. Thank you for that, Nathan. On Friday of this week, the House of Lords International Relations and Defence Select Committee is taking evidence from the world Health Organization. Now, you will have followed the controversy uh, from Wuhan through COVID-19 and all the issues that we've been facing. And first of all, the silence that was imposed on young doctors who tried to whistleblow and tell the truth about what was happening in Wuhan. Before that evidence taking, 
voting session takes place on Friday. What would you be saying to people in organisations like the WHO and indeed other United Nations agencies and indeed the countries in Africa and Asia who have been taking out vast sums of money in debtedness uh, as part of the Belt and Road Initiative in their countries? What would you be saying to them about how they should be treating this seduction that uh, is so readily on offer now from Beijing? Well, uh, we all know that um, Beijing's diplomatic um, strategy, they have been really um, getting a lot of alliance in, in Africa and some more developing countries. And they, that is their well, official strategy since the 60s. So they've planned um, uh, for long and um, they're trying to manipulate this organization by having these um, so-called satellite countries or satellite folks. This is such a tragedy for me because, um, well, uh, uh, well, such meaningful and important um, superstructural organization are being manipulated by countries like this is definitely a, a loss to the to the world and to a lot of um, professionals who have committed their lives into building um, this organization. So I think, um, yeah, indeed, uh, we, we need to have a revision and re we need to reestablish the legitimacy of this international organization, but not by just appealing to the public saying that they're, they're all fine, but by really look into the current mechanism and stop them to be manipulated by countries like China, China or being, um, uh, well, um, inclined, inclined to uh, their position and to have a, well, complete reform of them. And with an organization like the WHO, which has excluded Taiwan, for instance, from membership of the WHO at the bidding of China, and yet Taiwan has had such an interesting story to tell in terms of the way that it's dealt with COVID, just literally a handful of deaths in a population of 23 million people without any of the authoritarianism of, of Beijing having to be... Taiwan is much people's minds. There was a question in Parliament yesterday about Taiwan and, and independence. Do you think people of Taiwan need to consider their as of what's been happening in Hong Kong? Well, I think, um, yeah, the story of Taiwan, especially in, 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 in the combat towards COVID, is really interesting. Or I could say that they are the most effective democratic government around the world in terms of combating COVID-19. So I think uh, that exclusion of Taiwan in WHO really signals that um, there are, like these uh, politics manipulated by China is actually influencing uh, the exercise of professional, professionalism really badly. So I think this is one thing that we really indeed have to review. And um, for the Taiwanese people, I think um, the what, what happened in Hong Kong really invigorates the sense of them to, to get independent, to get uh, rid of China, because uh, they could see that one country, two system in Hong Kong is not working and they wanted to preserve their life. They don't want to be like Hong Kong, which we're losing our freedom of expression. We're, we, we don't have democracy. Uh, we're losing our individual freedom. So I think uh, the way Beijing treats Hong Kong and treats the world actually um, had a very negative effect on them trying to reunify Taiwan and the world should really pay effort to help Taiwan to establish its own legitimacy, especially in this international organization and in some more um, uh, policy level. Well, I think we've gone through all the questions that have been submitted to us, and uh, there's to be a session now with one or two of the journalists who wanted to stay on to talk to you with further detail, Nathan, but I'm also conscious of you being subjected to an arduous journey and that you've had uh, quite a lot of demands placed on you already in the last uh, 24 hours and must I think by now you you must be feeling pretty exhausted so just on behalf of the all party parliamentary group um, I'd like to thank you very much indeed for taking part in this webinar today and sharing your thoughts with us uh, we will be making the recording available via the APPG to other parliamentarians interest that have not been able to be present today our group as a platform in the months ahead and will again be a free and open Hong Kong where 
the liberties that the people there so much demand and, and desire will, will be achieved. And I know that you will be the reason we'll have. We're extremely grateful to you very much for your time today. Thank you so much for your presentation. To come back here. Right. I'm Thank you. Lord Alton broke up then, I'm afraid. So um, I think not... for more to have just have a quick word to, to finish. And then, Christopher, I'm going to hand over to you. I have done, but it's. <laughs> Can you hear me now? No. no. Yes, yes. If you want to speak, Nathan, if you can be heard, please go ahead. And then Christopher. Nathan, I think Lord Alton's inviting you to make any closing remarks before the parliamentary representatives leave, and then we can stay and ask oh, for any uh, additional press. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah, the international connection is a bit unstable, so sometimes I, I, I miss some of the words. Um, oh, oh thanks, thanks, thanks for the invitation um, by the ABBG um, of Hong Kong, and I think it's a precious opportunity for me to build some more connections with uh, the MPs and uh, all the uh, political organizations in, in the UK, especially in this very special era. So for me, um, uh, I will continue to be serving your interest if you are interested in uh, knowing more about Hong Kong, and I hope that uh, we could uh, form a better alliance in, uh, in terms of holding China accountable and becoming, uh, well, uh, the leading force of democracy. Well, I hope that as a legislator uh, now living in London, at least for the time being, that you'll become a, an honorary member of our all-party parliamentary group, and that we'll see you at uh, future meetings and participating in them and bringing your expertise and wisdom. It will be extremely welcome. And now with that concluding so remark from me, hopefully, overrate the discussion with our friends from the press. Thank you, Lord Alton, for chairing. Thank you, Lord Shinquin and uh, Mrs. Fiona Bruce, MP, for participating. Um, ladies and gentlemen of the press, um, for some reason, I'm not able to read messages in the chat, but I'm guessing that some of you must have put them in there because Lord Alton was calling questions. Um, but uh, if you've got any questions, Laura will um, feed them and read them so that Nathan uh, can continue to answer them for another 10 minutes or so um, if, if there's anything pressing you wish to ask. Nobody from the press is signalling me. Yeah, no, I am. You are, John. Go I'm, for it. I'm, I'm very happy to. I didn't know I was sort of, didn't know if I was meant to be emailing or not. Sorry, Nathan, can I, can I just press a little bit on two things? Just on the London question and on whether the British government is stepping up to the mark um, as you would like them to, uh, particularly with their offer of uh, residency. And the other thing I would just be very keen in knowing a little bit about is, you know, away from the um, your time campaigning and so on, how are you spending your time in London? Well, um, my time is... How, uh, how am I spending my time? It's simple. It's taking interviews and doing all these conferences. Uh, I don't really have anything to do <laughs> because these are all already jammed up all my time and energy. And, um, well, uh, I'm sorry, uh, may I beg your pardon for the first question because that was uh, some in internet connection problem. I, I didn't hear it very clearly. Maybe the accent, Nathan. Mine. It might have been my accent, Scottish. Oh, no, 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 because uh, the, the internet was, was quite unstable, so I, I missed the first question. Yeah, so, sorry, so so I asked you earlier about London and why you've chosen uh, London to base yourself. Uh -uh. I, I, I was looking for you to go on and speak a little bit about what you thought of, you know, how the British government was doing and standing up to China, you know, particularly with the residency offer, but also with Huawei yesterday, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. A little bit in whether that augured well for you being here, 
that the British government had got a bit of lead in their pencil as well? Well, uh, to make it clear, I don't have a BNO. I am not um, bene benefit by uh, the current policy by the UK government, so that is not the reason why I'm here. Uh, and secondly, I think, um, yeah, uh, we, as I've mentioned, um, for me, it's important that we seek more allies internationally, including UK and the other countries in European Union and Euro Europe as a whole. So for me, um, we, we have witnessed some more assertive stance from the UK government, which we really appreciate that. And uh, I hope that this um, kind of like tradition or this kind of like change of trajectory or shifting, China, shifting attitudes towards China could continue and could be expanded to the whole UK, to the whole Europe. So for me, um, we, uh, we've got uh, Hong Kong and London, we've got a long tradition of, of interaction, including political, cultural, and we've got a large community here. We've got Hong Kong, Hong Kong Watch as a very prominent human rights activist group to help uh, Hong Kong. We've got um, MPs and um, uh, 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 well, politicians like Lord Elton. They've been really helpful for the cause. So um, it's definitely beneficial for me to say in London and keep in touch with them and to speak up for Hong Kong people. Thank you, Nathan. We've had um, a question in from Patrick Winter, which is also asked by Catherine Philp. Um, could you say a bit more about the need for young protesters to be given BNO or some other sort of status, those who are too young to qualify? And in asking that question on their behalf, I believe, and Ben Rogers may be able to say more about this, that Pretty Pal made a comment um, in a select committee appearance earlier today, I'm getting stage nodges from Ben, to the extent that he was going to look into that problem of the 18 to 22 year olds who were in fact too young to have qualified for BNO status. So Nathan, if you could say a bit more about the people on the street, the frontliners, as I believe they're called, um, and what the British government could do um, to help them, bearing in mind you've already told us that uh, there's very little prospect of three million people upping and leaving Hong Kong. Um, and even if they wanted to, I can't believe that China would ever allow them to do it. The loss of space would be unthinkable to the Communist Party. Yeah, well, uh, first of all, I think this is a very important question because, um, uh, as we all know, BNO could be granted before, uh, pretty granted to the people be uh, born before 1997. So anyone at the age under 23 would not be able to have it. So I think it is important that we also extend that uh, treatment to them in order to really showcast that um, the reason why there's a re arrangement is because of the protest, it's because of the crisis, it's because of the uh, actions by the government which violate um, humanitarian values. So I think extending that treatment is important. And also uh, there are comments of introducing background search. And I also agree that, like for example, those police who committed into human rights violations should not be allowed it, to do it because we have that policy with a purpose. That purpose is to uh, provide humanitarian assistance. And we are not going to give it to those who commit into humanitarian crisis. So I think um, this, is, this is also important. And for the long run, if there are still, like we would seen pretty young faces on, on the street, like 14, 16, 17, uh, if they have any records of being convicted or being in, indicted because of the movement, uh, when they apply for visa or apply for immigration, these, consider, uh, these records should not be considered or even you could give them more preferential treatment if it is the case. Uh, and these, these, these in, in Indonesian or these arrests, uh, this uh, prosecution should not be a bad thing for them to go to the UK. Uh, thank you for that, Nathan. Um, I think it is worth just repeating what uh, was said earlier about Section 38 of the new national security mm. law, um, which is that everybody who is on this call, um, as things stand today, would be liable for extradition to Hong Kong and from there to China and face trial and if convicted, as 98.5% of people who are trade in China are, um, then you could face life imprisonment. 
Um, and I just leave you to think the chill thoughts about what was intended by that legislation. Um, we have a question from uh, William James, uh, who I think is Sky. Uh, could, Nathan, could you comment um, on the moves by the US administration to remove Hong Kong's special status? Well, I think um, uh, people say that it's Chang sanction. I, I don't really think that um, that is the right way to interpret it because um, if you're talking about preferential treatment, then we have to understand why there is a preferential treatment um, when uh, uh, about on, on Hong Kong, which uh, other countries treat differently uh, from China. And the reason why there is a preferential treatment is that Hong Kong remain highly autonomous and they have different system from China so that uh, they could guarantee, for example, rule of law, or they could guarantee that um, those uh, well goods sending to Hong Kong will not be used in bad ways. But for now, we, we have witnessed the loss of autonomy of Hong Kong and the loss uh, and, and the erosion of one country's system. So if Hong Kong cannot remain autonomous, then uh, there will be cancellation of the preferential treatment. I think that is a spirit of a like contract-like thinking instead of like you are punishing uh, Hong Kong uh, without any causes. So I think um, if you're talking about preferential treatment, yes, if the world thinks that Hong Kong is not autonomous anymore, then they are un entitled to do so. Any more questions from our media colleagues? I see no blue hands and no messages in the um, inbox. So, ladies and gentlemen of the um, media, thank you for joining us. I hope you found that helpful. If you have follow-up requests for interviews, as I know several of you have, because you've been in touch earlier today, um, Nathan hopes to be able to do some in the near future, but it won't be today because the rest of his time is spoken for, and hopefully at some point he will also sleep. Um, so thank you for joining us. I'm going to log off now. This video will be made available to you through our YouTube channel and uh, the White House Consultancy website fairly promptly. I've had some of your picture editors asking for snapshots as well while you've been in here. Um, so we'll be trying to meet all those needs. Laura won't be getting much sleep tonight. Um, but thank you all for coming. And goodbye, and thank you, Nathan, again, in particular. It's been a pleasure and a privilege to meet a young Democrat who has taken such a stand of principle and left his home and country. We feel honoured to have you join us. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you so much. Goodbye to all. Bye.